assalamu alaikum students hope you all are fine today we are going to start the region of neuroanatomy and our topic of discussion is gross anatomy of spinal cord before going on to the topic of spinal cord uh, here is a brief introduction to recall your previous knowledge that nervous system and the endocrine system control the functions of the body the nervous system composed basically of specialized cells whose function is to receive sensory stimuli and to transmit them to effector organs in addition the nervous system has the ability to store sensory information received during past experiences the nervous system is divided into two parts the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system there are two components of central nervous system the brain and spinal cord which are the main centers where correlation and integration of nervous information occurs in the peripheral nervous system the cranial and spinal nerves which consists of bundles of nerve fibers or axons conduct information to and from the central nervous system now the uh, information or stimuli outside uh, the body or from within the body is carried out by the cranial and spinal nerves to the central nervous system uh, which consists of spinal cord and brain where uh, the integration of this information occurs and the response to the effector organs is also carried by these nerves vertebral column it is a central bony pillar of the body within its cavity lie the spinal cord the roots of spinal nerves and the covering meninges to which the vertebral column gives great protection composition of the vertebral column the vertebral column is composed of 33 vertebrae seven cervical from c1 to c7 12 thoracic vertebrae from t1 to t12 Five lumbar vertebrae from L1 to L5, five sacral, which are fused to form the sacrum, and four coccygeal. The lower three are commonly fused. It is segmented and made up of vertebrae, joints, and pads of fibrocartilage called the intervertebral discs. Now here you can see the intervertebral discs, which are present between the vertebrae. the vertebral column shows an s shaped curve uh, when uh, view from the lateral side the cervical spine curves inward slightly inward and the thoracic spine curves outward and the lumbar spine curves inward like the cervical spine Here is brief review of general characteristics of a typical vertebra. Details already have discussed in your uh, previous lectures. As uh, you all know that uh, there are some regional differences in vertebra, which you can see in this diagram, uh, but they possess uh, some common features or characteristics, uh, which uh, you will revise here. Uh, here you can see a typical vertebra which possesses anteriorly a round body. and a posteriorly a vertebral arch this one is the vertebral arch these encloses a space which is called the vertebral foramen through which the spinal cord run along with its meninges now the vertebral arch is formed by a pair of pedicles and lamina these are pedicles which are forming the sides of the vertebral arch each pedicle is notched on its upper and lower border forming the superior and inferior notches on each side the superior notch of one vertebra and inferior notch of the adjacent vertebra forming the intervertebral foramen uh, which transmit the spinal nerves and vessels posteriorly the arch is complete by these flattened lamina here you can see the spinous process and these are the transverse processes 
this is the superior view so you can see the superior articular facets on the inferior surface inferior articular facets are present and uh, superior articular facets of one vertebra articulates with the inferior articular facets of adjacent vertebra forming the synovial joints joints of the vertebral column vertebrae articulate with each other by means of cartilaginous joints between their bodies and by synovial joints between their articular processes here you can see bodies of the vertebrae articulate through a fibrocartilage which is called the intervertebral disc and here the superior articular process and inferior articular process of the adjacent vertebrae articulate forming a synovial joint now joints between two vertebral bodies sandwiched between two vertebral bodies is an intervertebral disc of fibrocartilage as i already told you that this fibrocartilage which is present in between the bodies of the vertebrae is called intervertebral disc the upper and lower surfaces of the bodies of adjacent vertebrae that are in contact with the disc are covered with thin plates of hyaline cartilage now these uh, bodies are not in direct contact with the intervertebral disc but the surface which is in contact uh, with the fibrocartilage is covered by this high line cartilage here you can see the high line cartilage covered the superior or inferior surface of the adjacent vertebrae in contact with the intervertebral disc intervertebral discs the intervertebral discs are thickest in the cervical and lumbar regions where the movements of the vertebral column are greatest they serve as shock absorbers when the load on the vertebral column is suddenly increased each disc consists of a peripheral part the annulus fibrosus here you can see a peripheral part which is called the annulus fibrosus and a central part the nucleus pulposus the annulus fibrosus is composed of fibrocartilage which is strongly attached to the vertebral bodies and the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments of the vertebral column these ligaments we will later discuss in this discussion the nucleus pulposus in the young it is an ovoid mass of gelatinous material and situated slightly nearer to the posterior than to the anterior margin of the disc the semi fluid nature of the nucleus pulposus allows it to change shape and permits one vertebra to move forward or backward on another with, with advancing age the nucleus pulposus becomes smaller and is replaced by fibrocartilage the collagen fibers of the annulus degenerate and as a result the annulus cannot always contain the nucleus pulposus in old age the discs are thin and less elastic and it is no longer possible to distinguish the nucleus from the annulus now here you can Uh, very clearly uh, distinguish the annulus fibrosus and the nuclear nucleus pulposus in the young with advancing age the water content of the nucleus pulposus lost and uh, it is replaced by the fibrocartilage here you can see these degenerative uh, changes and in old age uh, this here you can see the thinning of the disc occurs 
an important clinical correlate of intervertebral disc is herniation of nucleus pulposus as i already told you that uh, intervertebral disc uh, serve as shock absorbers a sudden increase in the compression load on the vertebral column causes the nucleus pulposus to become flattened and this is accommodated by the resilience of the surrounding annulus fibrosus sometimes the outward thrust is too great for the annulus fibrosus and it ruptures allowing the nucleus pulposus to herniate and protrude into the vertebral canal where it may press on the spinal nerve roots the spinal nerve or even the spinal cord here you can see the rupture of the annulus fibrosus and the herniation of the nucleus pulposus compressing the nerve root here is the normal intervertebral disc showing intact annulus fibrosus and in uh, center there is the nucleus pulposus now the ligaments which stabilizes the joints between the vertebral bodies are the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligaments they run as continuous bands down the anterior and posterior surfaces of the vertebral column the anterior ligament is wide and is attached to the front and sides of the vertebral bodies and the intervertebral discs here you can see this continuous bands which is uh, attached to the front and sides of the vertebral bodies and intervertebral disc this is the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament is narrow here the vertebral arches are removed and uh, you can clearly see the posterior longitudinal ligament which is narrow and is attached to the posterior borders of the intervertebral disc joints between two vertebral arches the joints between two vertebral arches consists of synovial joints between the superior and inferior articular processes of adjacent vertebrae ligaments are supraspinous ligament which runs between the tips of the adjacent spines here you can see the tips of the spinous process of the vertebrae and this supraspinous ligament that connects the tips of the adjacent spinous processes of the vertebrae now the interspinous ligament this connects the adjacent spines okay now this one is the interspinous ligaments which is present between the spinous process of the adjacent vertebrae intertransverse ligament is runs between the transverse processes of the adjacent vertebrae here is the intertransverse ligament and the ligamentum flavum this connects the lamina of the adjacent vertebrae here in the anterior view you can see the lamina and in between lamina this is the ligamentum flavum and in this lateral view this one is the ligamentum flavum in the cervical region the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments are greatly thickened to form the ligam nuchae gross appearance of the spinal cord 
The spinal cord begins superiorly at the foramen magnum in the skull where it is continuous with the middle lobe longata of the brain and it terminates inferiorly in the adult at the level of the lower border of L1 vertebra. In the young child it is relatively longer and usually ends at the upper border of the L3 vertebra. Now this level of the termination of spinal cord is very important and very frequently asked question in the viva. Spinal cord is surrounded by three meninges, the dura mater, only meningeal layer of dura mater, the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. Here you can see this outer one layer is the dura mater then the arachnoid matter and then the pia matter. The space between the dura matter and the endosteum of the vertebral column is called the epidural space and uh, which is used to give the epidural anesthesia or uh, and the space between the arachnoid matter and pia matter is the subarachnoid space where the CSF is present and uh, the pia mater undergoes modifications uh, as follows uh, which is a denticulate ligament which keep the spinal cord in position and linear splendens is a thickening seen at the anteromedian sulcus these are supporting structures uh, which keep the spinal cord in position Spinal cord shows two enlargements in its course. In the cervical region where it gives origin to the brachial plexus supplying the upper limb and in the lower thoracic and lumbar regions where it gives origin to the lumbosacral plexus supplying the lower limb, the spinal cord is fusiformly enlarged and these enlargements are referred as cervical and lumbar enlargements respectively. Here you can see the cervical enlargement extending from C5 to T1 spinal segments and the lumbosacral enlargement extending from L2 to S3 spinal segments. Inferiorly the spinal cord tapers off into the conus medullaris. Here you can see the tapered end of the spinal cord called the conus medullaris from the apex of which a prolongation of pia mater the phylum terminal descends and leave through the sacral hiatus to be attached to the posterior surface of the coccyx from the apex of the conus medullaris here you can see a prolongation of pyometer called the phylum terminal which is attaches to the posterior surface of the coccyx. Because of the shortness of the spinal cord relative to the length of vertebral column the nerve roots of the lumbar and sacral segments have to take an oblique course downward to reach their respective intervertebral foramina. The resulting leash of nerve roots form the corda equina. Achha ji, ab aapko ye baat to pata chal gai hai ke spinal cord jo hai wo in adults uh, terminate ho jati hai, end ho jati hai at the level of the lower border of L1 vertebra. ओके okay, इसके बाद uh, का जो पार्ट रह जाता है वर्टिब्रल कॉलम का अब वहां तक ये नर्व रूट्स कैसे जाती हैं कि ये डिसेंड होती हैं ठीक है ये डिसेंड करती हैं इनका यो एक ओब्लिक कोर्स और अपने रिस्पेक्टिव uh, फोरामेन के थ्रू ये वर्टिब्रल uh, कॉलम से बाहर निकल जाती हैं तो ये जो फाइबर्स है ये लीश uh, है जो इन नर्व रूट्स की को सारे जो फाइबर्स इकट्ठे होके एक अपीयरेंस देते हैं लाइक हॉर्स टेल दैट्स व्हाई दिस इज कॉल्ड द कॉर्डा इक्वाइना हियर यू कैन सी द कॉर्डा इक्वाइना
Anteriorly in the midline the cord possesses a deep longitudinal fissure called anterior median fissure. Here you can see on the anterior surface a deep fissure or groove is present which is called the anterior median fissure. On the posterior surface there is a shallow furrow which is called the posterior median sulcus. Along the entire length of the spinal cord are attached 31 pairs of spinal nerves by the anterior or motor roots and the posterior or sensory roots. Here you can see a spinal nerve which is attached to the spinal cord through the anterior or motor root and the posterior or sensory root. Each root is attached to the spinal cord uh, through a series of rootlets. Here you can see numerous rootlets which are attached to the entire length of the corresponding segment of the spinal cord and each posterior nerve root possesses a posterior root ganglion, the cells of which gives rise to peripheral and central nerve fibers. Here the, the, you can see the posterior or dorsal root of the uh, spinal nerve and uh, this dilated part is called the dorsal root ganglion. The cells of which give rise to peripheral and central nerve fibers. On cross section you will see that spinal cord is composed of an inner core of gray matter which is H shaped or butterfly shaped and which is surrounded by the outer core of white matter. As the spinal cord is much shorter than the length of vertebral column, the spinal segments do not lie opposite the corresponding vertebrae. In estimating the position of a spinal segment in relation to the surface of the body, it is important to remember that a vertebral spine is always lower than the corresponding spinal segment. Here in this uh, table you can see the vertebral uh, levels at, at which the uh, spinal segments are present. First is the C1 to C7 vertebral level and uh, here the C1 to C8 spinal segments are present. Then T1 to T6 vertebral level and here the T1 to T8 spinal segments are present. Then T7 to T9 vertebral level and then here is the T10 to T12 spinal segments. Then T10 to T11 vertebral levels at which the L1 to L5 spinal segments are present and last one is the T12 to L1 uh, vertebral level and here is the S1 to S5 and coccygeal 1 spinal segment is present. Now the clinical correlates lumbar puncture it is a procedure that is used to examine the CSF as you all know that CSF cerebrospinal fluid is present in the subarachnoid space and it is mainly used for the diagnostic purposes like infection, inflammatory diseases and trauma, uh, traumatic injuries and it can also be used for therapeutically and for anesthesia. In approximately 94% of individuals uh, the spinal cord terminates at the level of L1 vertebra in the further 6% of individuals, the spinal cord can extend to the L2 to L3 interspace. Therefore, a lumbar puncture is generally performed at or below the L3 and L4 interspace. Uh, now, here you can see that uh, needle insertion uh, should be uh, between L3 and L4 vertebrae in adults and uh, it should be uh, between L4 and L5 in children because the spinal cord level is a uh, little below in children than in adults. Conus medullaris syndrome. Conus medullaris is the tapered end of the spinal cord and uh, due to injury to S2, S3 and S4 segments of the spinal cord, 
uh, uh, features of the conus medullaris syndrome are anesthesia in the perineum as this region is supplied by these three segments involvement of bladder and bowel is early and sexual functions are affected as same nerves carry out sexual functions as well corda equina syndrome as i already told you that corda equina is a bundle of nerve fibers that arises from the terminal part of the spinal cord and descends to reach their respective intervertebral foramina uh, damage to corda equina uh, which uh, causes of the uh, damage to the corda equina can be herniation of the disc or any traumatic injury and these results in a lower motor neuron type of paralysis in the lower limbs due to compression of ventral or anterior nerve roots uh, root pains is an important symptoms due to involvement of dorsal or posterior nerve roots and bladder and bowel involvement is late here is your today's assignment that's all for today. Thank you.